Okay, time for You Make the Call. This is where I show you one image with, or one slide with two images, and we discuss what this likely is, and then we look at the answer, and we see how well we did. So again, it's a challenge because you only will see two images, and I apologize, there's a little bit of history, but I wanna leave it where you think about the case. You come up with a differential diagnosis. Sometimes you'll be right and sometimes you'll be wrong. Sometimes you'll be right for the wrong reason and sometimes you'll be wrong for the right reason. Anyway, here we go. This patient's post-trauma and you see a lesion in the tail of the pancreas. It looks kind of cystic. And of course, when I tell you trauma, you're worrying about pancreatic trauma. I don't see blood in the abdomen. I don't see any injury to the kidney. I don't see the spleen, but maybe it's the sections. This looks cystic. With pancreatic trauma, you get changes that look like pancreatitis or you get pancreatic lacerations. This likely is just going to be an incidental pancreatic lesion. It's solid and cystic depending on the patient's age. You could think about things ranging from spend tumors to serous cyst adenomas, even theoretically an MCN. It looks like atrophy of the tail of the pancreas. And this was a serous cyst adenoma. So again, when you're doing trauma patients, you gotta think about pancreatic trauma, but incidental pancreatic lesions ranging from serous cyst adenomas to IPMNs are not going to be uncommon. Incidental finding, cystic lesion, body tail of pancreas junction, some faint calcifications are present. Based on location, I could think about perhaps a MCN, good location, particularly if the patient's a female in their 40s. I can think about a large IPMN. I could think about a cirrhosis that anoma is a possibility. It doesn't have the look of a spen tumor, doesn't have the look of an adenocarcinoma. The way it sits exophytic could be a lymphoepithelial cyst. Those are all going to be possibilities. This patient will typically get EUS, and this was a serous cyst adenoma. Remember, serous cyst adenomas have a range of appearance from multiple septations to calcifications, to oligocystic, which this is, a purely cystic lesion, and again, some faint calcifications in the periphery of the lesion. This patient has back pain. When you look at the lesions, you see something in the spleen. There looks like infiltration of the spleen, particularly on this good arterial phase imaging. There also appears to be infiltration of the body and tail of the pancreas. The adrenals look good, the liver looks good, the stomach looks good. There are some nodes near the pancreas and subcrural nodes present, including a posterior mediastinal node in the chest. And when I see anything infiltrating the spleen and involving the pancreas, or even just infiltration of the spleen alone, I gotta be thinking about lymphoma. Could it be metastasis? Yes. But, you know, multi-organ involvement, particularly when the spleen is involved, you got to be thinking about lymphoma. And this was B-cell lymphoma involving the spleen and pancreas and also the presence of adenopathy. Patient with chest pain, large mass in the mediastinum. It's mainly anterior. There's a stent in the SVC. You gotta be thinking, depending on the age, lymphoma, thymoma, teratoma. You know, you know, we talk about the three T's, right? Thyroid, teratoma, thymoma. We talk about various thymic tumors from carcinoid to anaplastic carcinoma. We talk about lymphoma. We also need to mention at times metastatic disease to the mediastinum. You go through that differential, there's no chest wall involvement. And this was a carcinoid tumor. So again, in the differential, I think you could be very good, but we all know this patient needs a biopsy. 
This is not going to be a resectable tumor as there is diffuse infiltration and as noted involvement of the pulmonary artery and encasement of the aorta is seen. This patient has a pelvic mass. This fact, multiple pelvic masses. They're cystic. This is a female. I got to be thinking about ovarian cancer. Yes, you can think about other things, but complex cystic masses, particularly an older patient, older woman, you got to be thinking about ovarian cancer. A younger patient, you can even consider endometriosis, which can have many different appearances. If you talk about malignancy, we talk about primary ovarian cancer. You can have metastasis to the ovaries, like Krukenberg tumors that can occur from pancreatic cancer, gastric cancer, small bowel tumor, other mucinous tumors are all possibilities. This patient had surgery following, followed by a prior biopsy, and this was ovarian metastasis from pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Again, we think about pancreatic adenocarcinoma, local vessel invasion, liver metastasis, local nodes, lung metastasis, carcinomatosis, but it also is one of the things that gives metastasis to the, to the ovary, the so-called Krukenberg tumors, just a really nice example here. This patient has pelvic pain and you can see on the image on your right, complex cystic mass arising out of the pelvis. Now this was a female, so you can say, well, this could be ovarian cancer, that would be a good thought. You can go through metastasis to the ovaries, we have mentioned that previously, but one of the things you always need to think about, particularly in a patient with a history of pelvic pain, and just the history doesn't seem to match malignancy, is endometriosis. Endometriosis is a great mimicker. It can involve the ovaries. It could present with torsion of the ovaries. It could present with bleeding, large masses looking like malignancy. So in this case, you have to exclude malignancy. This patient had surgery. This was endometriosis. So again, endometriosis is a great mimicker. No problem making the diagnosis in most cases if you think about it. If you don't think about it, this patient will go to surgery and the workup will be for cancer and the patient looks out with endometriosis. Now, endometriosis is not a, it's a benign disease, but it causes all sorts of symptoms from pain, can result in bowel obstruction, implants in the abdominal wall. So it's an aggressive benign process. This patient had renal cell carcinoma with a yearly follow-up, and you can see multiple enhancing lesions in the head of the pancreas with a dilated pancreatic duct. You also see an enhancing lesion in the left paraspinal muscles. We speak about vascular lesions in the pancreas, and we always think about neuroendocrine tumors, which is the right thing to think about. But once you've had renal cell, you gotta think about meds to the pancreas, Typically, it's not something that occurs at presentation. It typically occurs 10 years later. The patients, if that's the only findings, will get a uh, pancreatic resection and they could do fine. This case is more difficult because the patient already has muscle metastasis, which is very problematic. And again, METs from the renal cell, clear cell typically, the METs are very vascular, be it pancreas, be it muscle, be it lung, be it bone, be it liver. So a really nice example of metastatic renal cell carcinoma to the pancreas. And again, you can see how quickly the lesions wash out. There is mass effect, obviously, with dilated pancreatic duct on the venous phase imaging, but look how quickly from arterial to venous the lesion will wash out. It does make the point why small metastasis to the pancreas can easily be missed if you don't do routine arterial phase imaging. When you're restaging or following up metastatic renal cell carcinoma or just suspected or routine follow-up for clear cell, you must do dual phase imaging. This was a calcium scoring study, and we see what looks like multiple masses on the diaphragm, a mass posteriorly on the pleura, and a mass underneath the diaphragm. 
Again, you can go through things like lung cancer, implants, lymphoma. This was a case, a really interesting case, when I got old scans in the abdomen, the patient had a splenectomy previously, and these were splen splenules or splenosis post-trauma. Splenosis typically occurs in the splenic bed, but can occur anywhere in the abdomen, can also occur on the diaphragm or in the lungs. We all have seen quiz cases of splenosis presenting as a solitary lung nodule. This study was done for evaluation of a pancreatic mass, and you can see there's an enhancing lesion. It looks like it's maybe in the pancreas or pushing on the pancreas, but it's very vascular. If this is indeed pancreas, then it's a neuroendocrine tumor. But on these images, you also have to consider, could it be small bowel? If it's small bowel, then you gotta say carcinoid tumor or gist tumor. Both of those are typically vascular when they're in the duodenum, particularly when they're smaller lesions, and they can truly simulate a pancreatic tumor. And this was a gist tumor. So again, uh, if you did some reconstructions, you would have seen here there's no dilated pancreatic duct, there's no dilated common duct. If this was a pancreatic mass, you always or almost always are going to see pancreatic duct and common duct dilatation. When you don't see that, you really have to think that perhaps the primary process is duodenum. Using coronal views will make this also a whole lot easier. This patient has back pain, and when you look at the non-contrast, there's a mass in the pararenal space, which enhances. What occurs in the pararenal space? Typically, I think about lymphoma. You could see extramedullary hematopoiesis, but typically not that kind of just a discrete mass. When you look at the images carefully, the spleen rotates posteriorly, the bowel falls posteriorly on the left side. This patient had a prior nephrectomy, and what this was is metastatic disease to the right pararenal space. It's an unusual appearance for metastasis. And if you look hard, there is a suggestion of possible metastasis to the head of pancreas. But I really like this case of the paraspinal or pararenal space involvement because you got to think about things. Again, lymphoma, metastasis, more extensive extramedullary hematopoiesis, IG4 disease, and there are a number of other things you would need to think about. And in this case, it was metastatic renal cell. So again, a logical approach, thinking about the possibilities, and then looking at the full scan, in this case, noting that the patient probably had a nephrectomy, will make your job a whole lot easier. This patient had a fever, there's a large mass. When you look at this mass, it's coming from the liver. Yes, I would give you more images, including coronal, but a very large aggressive mass coming from the liver that's necrotic, there's ascites present. This could be a hepatoma, there's some vascularity present. Metastasis are a possibility, but this for all the world because of its size looks like a primary liver mass. It doesn't have the typical look of thinking about cholangiocarcinoma. It's not a benign lesion, it's not FNH, it's not a patagadenoma. Um, could this be a biliary cyst adenocarcinoma? They can be large and cystic, and that's a possibility. If this was a younger person, embryonal cell sarcoma is a possibility. So occasionally you do get sarcomas of the liver. This was eventually biopsied and the patient was a bit younger, and this was an embryonal cell sarcoma of the liver. Again, large mass, necrotic. Think about hepatoma first. Think about sarcomas. Think about metastasis, though when it's this big, that's not going to happen. Think about biliary cyst adenocarcinoma. Those are all great possibilities. Well, that's it. I've shown you lots of cases I hope you enjoyed them, I hope you enjoyed the discussion, and I hope you get them right when you see them in clinical practice. And with that, have a great day.
If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.